Mr. Tim Anderson, director with the Center for Counter Hegemonic Studies, joins us via Skype out of Sydney, Australia. Um, Mr. Anderson, what do you think about what uh, Antony Blinken has said regarding the Iranian sanctions? Thank you. I think Mr. Blinken has clarified two things. One is that the JCPOA discussions are not really to do with Iran's nuclear industry. It's all about trying to sideline Iran's influence in the region. So that being said, um, it's, it's hard to see that the nuclear deal is anything other than a corpse um, sitting in the morgue which no one wants to bury because Iran having the high moral ground doesn't really need to do anything. It says it's waiting on the US to come back to compliance in a practical sense. And on the other hand, the US perhaps is trying to provoke Iran to move away from it and therefore gain some kudos perhaps with the Europeans. But really, it seems to be going nowhere. You know, what's going to be Iran's uh, motivation and interest in even reviving the JCPOA when it knows uh, that, uh, you know, at least some of those sanctions, you know, as Mr. Blinken puts it, hundreds of them are going to remain in place. How are you going to play Iran into this when you're not giving it, you know, what it actually is asking for and, you know, it is legally asking for it? Well, that's right. I mean, there is nothing in it for Iran, nothing. The only thing that was promised was the removal of sanctions. That's the only reason why Iran subjected itself to the humiliation, really, of having a type of outside scrutiny of its nuclear industry, uh, which no other players have. Israel doesn't have it. Um, many other countries uh, don't have this. Un Iran was singled out at a certain time precisely because the U.S. was concerned about its influence in the region and it's not really to do with the supposed threat of nuclear weapons which Iran doesn't have. And where do you think it's going to leave the other parties of the JCPOA with the, if actually the U.S. is going to go ahead with its decision as far as at least Mr. Blinken says and, you know, remain? Uh, let some of those sanctions remain in place. Where do you think it's going to leave the other European partners of the JCPOA? Do you think they're going to comply or perhaps they're not going to, um, you know, keep things at least in a balance, you know, try to, you know, give something to Iran to, 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 to keep it within the JCPOA? What, what do you think there's, it's going to be their stance? Well, from the Europeans' point of view, they haven't really demonstrated that they have a will separate from the U.S. because they're concerned about retaliation by the U.S. if they proceed to normal commercial relationships with Iran, which they thought what they were going to have in 2015. Let's remember there's also Russia and China here who do have genuinely independent positions on this. And up until now, Russia and China have been trying to maintain the idea of uh, resurrecting the agreement, but who knows what they really feel behind the scenes. As I say, it may be that the U.S. is trying to provoke uh, Iran into a unilateral withdrawal um, and then try and, uh, you know, get into a blame game where they well, will try and sheep home the blame to Iran for destroying this deal. But really, no one wants it at this stage. There's nothing in it for Iran at all. And, you know, uh, I also wonder, Mr. Anderson, what kind of a message does the U.S or if it is actually even trying to send a message, uh, you know, out of the Vienna talks with this behavior that once you had this country signing a contract five, six years ago, and that country has actually complied fully to what it has signed, and not only you withdraw yourself from the accord uh, that you have signed and, uh, and said that you will do, not only that, but you say that those sanctions are going to remain in place, yet you want that country to again fully come, uh, 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 you know, foot the bill and, 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 you know, do what was enshrined in the JCPOA. I, I, I wonder to God, you know, what, what kind of message, you know, it's sending to other countries in the world. Well, it's certainly a sign of a recalcitrant power that is cynical and uh, obsessed with its own image in the world. I don't really think that has much impact on any of the players, really, because the Europeans know very well how cynical and self-centred the US is. But the fact is they are too compromised by their interlocking corporate arrangements that, that they fear are going to damage their own companies. So I don't think there's any idealism that mm. really bothers 
any of the players in this. They see the real politic, that the US is simply doing what it always does, being a bully, um, being hypocritical about its uh, moral arguments. I mean, who, what moral authority does the US have in the world anyway? Um, but I think, really, there may be still a bit of a, a blame game going on, trying to position um, people for uh, taking the blame when, finally, the corpse of this lifeless agreement gets finally buried. If the Maybe U.S. One... Yes, Mr. Anderson, if the U.S. really is going to go ahead with what, at least, you know, what, what Mr. Blinken has said, what kind of a roadmap do you think or what kind of a reaction would, would you say as an observer this is going to bring about uh, from Iran, from Russia, from, from China? And basically, you know, what kind of a response do you think the world is going to give this? Well, that response is already well in train. The Europeans did have a process of some being able to carry out independent financial relationships with countries under sanction. They began this back in the 90s with Cuba. They set up an instex process for Iran, but it's really been of very marginal importance. And now we see these very large commercial agreements that Iran has with China and is developing with Russia now. And we see that whole Eurasian movement, ironically, which was something that the U.S. tried to avoid. The U.S. is still to this day trying to block these Eurasian integration agreements, but their recalcitrance and their aggression in the entire West Asian region has really accelerated, I think, the process of really building some new financial architecture and commercial architecture um, from uh, the east of Asia to Europe. How would you guess Iran is going to respond to that? Iran is already building those alternatives, I guess. I think they don't want to really close down the possibility of normal commercial relationships with the Europeans, for example, but it's looking more and more like the U.S. is going to become, in the future, a marginalized player in, in the greater Eurasian scene. And were you surprised that, you know, an official with the Biden administration is basically, uh, you know, echoing what the, what the Trump administration had actually put in place? Well, in some respects, because you would think that the Biden administration wants to go back to the agreement that, that Biden himself was a part of in 2015. On the other hand, there's great continuity um, amongst all of the administrations, the last several administrations in the U.S. If you look at the wars in the Middle East, you, you recall there's a Biden official who said recently that um, the U.S. owns one third of Syria and is going to use that as leverage for a political outcome in Syria. So that was really the Trump administration's position. So Biden has inherited a great deal of Trump and there's much less change between U.S. administrations than perhaps people imagine. Mm -hmm. Many, many thanks, Mr. Tim Anderson, Director for Center for, uh, for Counter-Hegemonic Studies out of Sydney, Australia. I appreciate